Hi, this is Dr. Joe. Today I want to talk about debugging. Sometimes when you have a little bit of code to translate, for example, here's a bit we could look at, it might be difficult to get the translation correct because you might think that looking at this code there's a reasonable looking register assignment and your typical input process output that would work fine, but sometimes it doesn't and simply Debugging it by looking very carefully at register assignment and code doesn't always yield great results. You may not spot some of the subtle hidden features of the code. So let's look at ways to use the debugger to help with this. Now, in the past, we've been running all code here in the browser, but it's time to get out of that habit. If we go back to the main page of the course, you'll notice a link where you can download the examples which accompany this textbook. So let's go and download those examples and take a look at that. I'm going to go just extract all those into a, some temporary directory, just some convenient place. In my case, I just put it directly in the downloads directory. Now we want to pull up that particular debugging file. Here's how we're going to find it. Back here on the debugging page, look carefully at the URL. The last little bit is our clue. Right after static is a way to get to this particular file. So, in, so it looks like we need to go to unsigned 16-bit ops and then debugging.s. And I'm going to find that exact same file because these web pages are built from source code in the zip file. So again, unsigned 16-bit ops and then here is the debugging project that I need. I need to load that into MPLAB X. So I'll just pull up my start menu, type in MPLAB, and pull up MPLAB X IDE. And then we'll go and open a project. You remember the path that we picked earlier? We went to that unsigned 16-bit ops directory, and here's debugging.x. So that file is exactly what I'm looking at in the web page. In fact, when I open that project and go through and look at the source files, this debugging.s file may look statement. More complex statements can be difficult to debug without assistance. And here it is, because the program is turned directly into a web page using some tools that I have. So that means that it makes it fairly easy to understand what's happening. Here's exactly the same register assignment, and here's the actual code. So I'm just going to click there to create a breakpoint, and let's go ahead and debug that project. It'll compile and run. And because of the breakpoint, it'll stop right there before we've executed any code. And now let's go and look at some useful stuff. So in particular, we could look at the, the program in two different ways. We could look at the special function registers. If I scroll a bit, here's, a, here's WREG 0, 1, and 2. That's one way. However, I actually prefer to go pull this up under Watches. Now, if the Watches window is not open, that's fairly easy to do. It's just right here under Debugging, and we'll click on Watches to bring that open. Now let's enter some things we want to watch. The single click in there. Let's definitely watch underscore U16A. And we can see that that currently has the value of 15FE. So that's watching the variable in memory. So that can let me see what's happening in memory. Let's also watch a single click in that box, U16B. So now I can watch both of my inputs. Now this one's a little bit strange. The first one correctly identifies as two bytes. This says that it's 46 bytes long. Hmm, doesn't sound quite right. So let's take a look at that. And let's change that. Let's make a user-defined size of 16 bits. We know that should be a 16-bit value. Sometimes the program can't correctly infer the size because of the way it's defined. And now we've got a nice 16-bit value. Let's also look at our registers. From the watch window, they're called WREG0 for what we would call in the code W0 and so on and so forth. In our case, we have all the way up to W7 that we need to watch, so I'm going to add all those to my window. Alright, now we've got everything added. We're actually ready to begin the debugging process, and let's take a look at some of those questions to answer those questions as we go through the debug process. In particular, we want to know Okay, what value does U16A actually start with 
And then what does our program put into W2? Because as we know, W2 was assigned to store U16A. So let's watch that in our code. Now we can already see that U16A contains the value 15FE in hex. And if we execute one step, I can do that simply by clicking the step into or pressing function key 7 on my keyboard. If I execute one step, it runs that. And you'll notice this value turns red because WREG2 has now been assigned the value 15FE. And these red values really help me to find that. So I can tell that the value it should be is 15FE. The actual value loaded in my program is 15FE. So, so far, everything is running correctly. And of course, we can go ahead and type those answers in just to make sure we've got that correct. Great. The questions will continue to lead through it. What do we expect for U16B? What is our actual value? And of course, that's fairly easy to, ter to determine. Here we are. We're going to execute one more line of code. Again, I'm going to do that step into. We've just run this line of code. So you can see that W3 is red, and from earlier, U16B is A150. Those agree it looks like we're in good shape there. And we can continue on. I'll let you fill in the blanks, but here's the number 300 that should be going into W4. I'm going to press F7 instead of going to the menu. I see that it changed to OX012C. In some cases, I may want to have that in a different format, so I'll just right-click on that and display that as a decimal value. That's 300 in decimal. So I can look at the value in either way, and that makes it a little bit more convenient for looking at some of the things. Now we come to this point in the program. What is the expected value for W5? Well, we can see that we're supposed to complement W2 to W5. W2 is what U16A holds, and it's going to W5 here. So I'll go ahead and run that instruction. So we can see it produced EA01. How would I tell if that's correct? I'm going to go to the Start menu and pull up the Windows calculator. Uh, you can also use a handheld calculator or one on your cell phone, whatever is convenient. Well, we've got the calculator here. And if you notice there's several modes, I can put that in a standard mode, but what I really want here is the programmer's mode because that allows me to enter hexadecimal or decimal values very easily. So let's go through and look what we've got. We're supposed to be taking U16A, which is in W2, and complementing that to W5. So we know from earlier that W2, I U6, or with that U16A was 15FE. So I'm going to click on the hex mode and type that in, 15FE. And we're supposed to be complementing that into W5. So I'm going to click the Not button. And you can see EA01. Of course, we're not worried about the higher bits. This is just a 16-bit result. We see the EA01 there. So that looks good. Now, we are going to need to write this down. I'm actually going to type that in my code as a comment, because I'm going to have to use that later when I do an XOR right there. So let me record this. So I went and added a couple columns. For A, I have 15FE, as we know. For B, we have the A150 that we found. I went ahead and just typed that in anywhere, everywhere. I converted from that 300 that sits in W4, the number 300, back to hex. Everything else is in hex. That's going to make it easier to type in my calculator. And then I recorded that EA01 was the value I got from there. And from there, we can continue on in the code. I know that next. Looking at my code, I'm going to shift the W3 by 5 bits to W6. We're going to be implementing that. So I can type in W3. That's A150. Clear that. And then we're going to shift that left by 5 bits. So it should give me 2A00. Of course, I'm ignoring these upper hex digits. It's just a 16-bit result. So again, I'm going to press F7. We're going to run that piece of code. And the 2A00 does actually show up. So I'm going to write that down because otherwise I'll forget that. That's 2A00 should show up in W6. It does show up in W6. Continue with that. Go ahead and put fill in values for W7 and then the overall W1 and W0. And hopefully that will help you narrow down the problem and give you some insight on how to do that in other cases.